uh, Rahini Library, which was about a 20 minute walk away, was the first place that I could get books. There were no books in my house. I didn't know anybody with books. I, I grew up in a very uh, impoverished area uh, of the north side of Dublin. And uh, I discovered this little library and I was very young. I mean, we moved there when I was seven. So I probably was eight. And I started reading books in the in the library without bringing them home because they wouldn't give me a card because I I couldn't fulfill some bureaucratic requirement or get my mother to sign something I can't remember but I do remember reading a book called Amazon Adventure which was the first big book that I I read and I was really I think I was about eight at the time I guess and I kind of used to walk up to Rohini Library uh, a lot um several days a week and I used to sit and read books in there and then eventually I got a library card and could bring them home that's my earliest memory of uh, books and I loved them and I also remember the first time I bought a book we were going on a holiday to the Isle of Man believe it or not and uh, I bought a book in the I suppose it was the duty free of its day and I bought a science fiction book by Ursula K Le Guin which I don't remember which book I bought but um I remember my family being kind of amazed at what a waste of money that is. And I remember being, uh, obje- you know, getting that object, getting that pressure or resistance. And I was, I remember reading the book on the, it was quite a long trip, actually. I think it took six or seven hours to sail there. It's where you would go to the Bahamas. And uh, I remember kind of finishing it by the time I got off. And then people saying, well, that was a complete waste of money, wasn't it? I mean, you've already read it. So that's my first memory of encounter with with that, uh, with with books. I, I clearly remember those things, and, and they're very fresh memories to me still. They're very poignant. I don't know why. Yeah, I, I didn't. This, you know, uh, I I do remember starting off. Uh, writing, um, I wrote letters to my grandfather in Tipperary at the time. And uh, I remember he wrote back and said, that you, you need to learn to dictate a letter. <laughs> That's what he said. And I was about eight or nine. And uh, I remember that phrase, you need to study how to dictate a letter. And I think what he was driving at was that I didn't have the formality of a letter. I think I, I dove in, I, I dived in, sorry, I dove in. And uh, there you go, I dove instead of dived. And uh, it, it sort of was a bit of a shock to me, actually, that he would say that to a kid. <laughs> and I knew I was a kid, but he did. And uh, he, he wrote that. I still vividly remember reading that and then kind of getting my act together. And then I realized that writing was something I had to learn to do. But I loved doing it. And years later, my father died a year ago and I discovered in his briefcase um, a, a fake um, letter to Santa that I'd written as a joke, uh, asking for absurd things like uh, all kinds of nonsense, you know, uh, a list, uh, a fictitious list, a comic one. And my father kept that until he died. Uh, so he kept it for, you know, nearly 80 years. And uh, th- that's very striking to me that despite the fact that he thought it was daft that I was reading books, uh, spending money on it, you see, spending money on books, why is the money? And uh, at the same time, then he kept this first thing that I'd written uh, that time in my childhood, and uh, it that was very striking to me. Uh, it's written by hand, and you can it's really I could see my own handwriting from uh, with, uh, more than fifty years ago. So yeah, writing is powerful. I think. Not really. I, I went to school with a, a, a geyser. This bloke in my class, uh, when he was 14, his name was Matthew. Uh, he was my closest friend and he and I were big into writing and reading and we were reading stuff that wasn't on the course. So we were getting into trouble for that. I was reading, I was passionate about Dostoevsky in particular and my English teacher was given out to me for, it's not on the course at all. It was much more interesting. <laughs> and uh, see all the characters, there's loads of them, and it's Russian, and it's kind of a mad place. And I'm getting my head, I love all this. And um, Matthew uh, wrote a poem that was uh, impressed the English teacher so much. It's cut a long story short, he won Irish Times Young Poet of the Year, and it was published in the Irish Times. 
And he was the first person to say to me, and he was only about, he was 14 at the time, that he wanted to be a full-time writer. And I thought, I want to write as I didn't, full-time or not, I wanted to write as well. I wanted to write really seriously. And um, I didn't say second name deliberately because he never became a writer. Uh, things His life went off in a, in a different direction and it wasn't a very as positive uh, direction as it, as it could have been. At the same time, I grew up around the corner from a guy who was just a few years older to me, older than me, and he said to me he wants to be a full time writer, and he's now an internationally renowned writer. Uh, but he, we were there was a bunch of us that were into writing, and um, and quite a, a few of the people in that scene, as it were, and I'm big into the scene business, as in Brian Eno's work on seniors. I think that's very very strong work, uh, very important work. And that we were in a scene of both musicians and writers, and sometimes both. And a, a large number of the people in the scene are now quite famous. Some of them are dead now, but they they went on to be well-known writers. I don't, I don't like the word successful because it implies you made loads of money or something to do with money. But they were successful artists, uh, very successful and full time, and and that was the, that became their lives. Yeah, school was a like school was a bit weird. I, I I didn't feel like I was learning anything about how to write in school. I or, or I didn't feel I didn't feel I was learning about literature in school for some reason. It was just a bunch of uh, material we were expected to read. It was quite diverse and didn't quite it wasn't very coherent in my head. Um, and and I understand why they were doing that. They were giving us a range of possibilities, I suppose, which is their job. And I wouldn't criticize them for that, but. Uh, at the same time, I was on another uh, parallel universe of people who were exploring what they felt like. I don't want to be, that doesn't sound right, but we were just following our instinct in terms of what writing was attracting us. And uh, at the same time, I was very conscious, as were the others, about craft already, you know, even as young, very young. I mean, from the age of eight, my grandfather alerted me to craft, you know, there's a way to do this as a, a way that works and uh, you need to learn how to dictate as he puts it a letter and uh, we weren't learning the craft of writing in school that's not on the curriculum what's on the you, you, you kind of are you're getting clues but you're not really there to you're, you're there to write essays uh, critical essays about it you're not there to write anything or produce anything artistically which is fine because it's not their job but at the same time we were I was much more focused on what was outside the classroom than inside the classroom. So we wouldn't have been, well, we, myself and Matt and one or two others wouldn't have been well supported in that. You know? we, were, we were opposed in that, you know, and that didn't bother us at all. We just got on with things. And funny enough, we all passed our English exams because we read the material, but we hadn't studied it. It was really a strange thing. We paid attention and read the material and got through the exams, but we weren't taking that material very seriously. Not a lot of it, anyway. Uh, I don't know if that is the answer here. Yeah, I don't know if I've, I've got off on a big tangent there. <laughs> There's a point, in, not in terms of writing, but we were, we were, I would go as far as to say we were passively discouraged from the notion of going to university for any reason. The inside of a university was not where we were supposed to be. So it's very interesting to look back and think, I remember when a soldier uh, came to the school, an officer of some kind, to encourage us to become, to join the army. And that's fair enough. But what, what, what they were not encouraging us to do is become officers. They were encouraging us to become privates hmm. and uh, be the, the kind of grunts, as they say. And it was noticeable as well that uh, some of the people in my in my school, and it was a mixed school, by the way, were, were asking about apprenticeships and so on. And they weren't even encouraging that. It was as if we were given the clear message that we were, the, I hate to say it, the scum of the earth. We were we were the future criminals of the world in the backs of people's minds. And they were right about that to a point. A lot of a lot of people in my in, that I grew up with did go into crime and a lot of them died very young as a consequence of drug overdoses or uh, getting killed in the course of their lifestyle. And they, 
So we weren't encouraged to do anything of any with any ambition at all. And I distinctly remember one teacher saying, sort of mocking us in a way, saying, you know, you guys will all be digging holes in the future and I'll walk past you someday while you're down there with your shovel. I remember thinking, no, you won't. Or you effing won't was exactly what went through my mind. So there was no college possibility at all. That was just out. One person in the whole area made it into college. One. It's a bit like the Joe Duffy story in Ireland. This is a famous broadcaster who was the only guy in his area to first and only at the time to go to college. And then he was he was studying social work. And uh, one day they went on a field trip to see a deprived area. And as they were walking down the street as a group, everyone was saying hello to him. And then the group realized he lived there. They were doing a field trip of one of their own students area instead of asking him. So that was the milieu I grew up in. So no, it didn't go to any college. I didn't start any formal education until I was 30 years old. So I lost 13 years as I left school at 17. I lost 13 years of educational possibilities as a result of that. I think in relation to Japanese uh, literary forms, it's clear to me uh, how that happened. I was on a holiday in Devon one time, years and years ago, in the early 80s, and I went into a secondhand bookshop and bought a huge poet's test, um, almanac, a kind of guide to poetry, it was called, and a thesaurus was the second hand, big, huge thing, for five pounds, which was a lot of money at the time, because the thing was uh, second hand as well. But I was very drawn to this big hardback tome and I brought it home. And the first half was all about different uh, poetry uh, forms and so on, the usual, the Villanelle, the Sestinas and everything else. And we're all in there, and very well written. And I read the whole thing. And on the last two pages, it had about haiku, just two pages. And I was struck by whatever it said about it. And... Uh, I decided to follow that. I'd, uh, I'd explore that a bit more. I was kind of taken by that. I was trying various forms of writing at the time. And uh, that led me into, that tied in with the fact that I was reading a lot without realizing it. I had been reading a huge amount of, of, of Eastern philosophy for several years. And I was particularly interested in Zen Buddhism, not Buddhism, Zen Buddhism. And eventually, by accident, I came across uh, a Soto Zen monk from the Soto school who, who I then trained with. So the combination of training in Zen under a French monk <laughs> uh, and very rigorously training and like getting up in the middle of the night and going into the city center for a 7 a.m. session four days a week and all that kind of thing for several years and uh, starting to unravel what I could about haiku, uh, I guess it knitted a lot of things together. And incidentally, by coincidence, from the age of about eight, I had joined a judo club, which of course is Japanese martial art. And I didn't think of it as Japanese, it was just judo. And it was it was just convenient because that was nearby. And then later I went on to do Aikido. And I'm talking four nights a week and the weekends all the time for years and all that. So I had this kind of connection with Japanese culture that was subconscious or, or I was unaware of it. And it, it seemed to bring it in together. Eventually I ended up living in Japan for five years in rural Japan. And it was there when I started working, especially true Japanese with the, the, the writers there and some very serious writers like Yuasa San, I met many times and worked with him, who was the guy who translated the first translation in English of the Narrow Road to the Deep North published in 1968. He's still alive, by the way. I still correspond with him. He's in his 90s now. And when you start, when I started working for those five years with the Japanese themselves, then it really cemented what, what these forms, because it's not just the haiku, it expanded into uh, waka or tanka and the high boon form. And it was just a goldmine for me because it's, it just seemed to suit me. And I can't put it any clearer than that. Uh, in particular, because of the strength, the importance, the clear importance of rhythm in those forms, which probably suited me as a person who's very strong on rhythm as a musician as well. You know, it it sits well with, I suppose, who I am. So it all of those things combined, uh, and in terms of 
writing, uh, I wrote, I, I did unconsciously or unknowingly what the Japanese would recommend, by the way, in terms of that type of writing. I spent years practicing and writing literally thousands of them before I submitted anything anywhere, showed anybody anything. And I, I did the hard work. Shu Hari in Japanese is, is the concept. Shu is that period, the long period of practice and learning craft and technique and conscious effort, uh, usually under the guidance of someone who's quite masterful at it or well-established. And I did all of that without realizing that that's what would be expected of you. So I, I took no shortcuts and I spent decades working on it, quite literally decades. The early 80s that the bookshop visit was made, I think around 1984. I was in Devon. Uh, so it's nearly 40 years now. Um, slowly is the short answer. So uh, by, by the, you see, I, I started this writing around 1984, 85, and it was 10 years then before I met a guy called Jim Norton, who, who had just set up a journal, a print journal called Haiku Spirit, which ran for 20 issues over five years. And he became a mentor of mine. And that was a, a, a f for a couple of years. And then I became the, he stopped editing and I took over. And then I became the editor of that journal for its final eight issues. <clears throat> and as they say, one thing led to another, but very slowly over a very long period of time. So I, I then my the first book I uh, co-authored was written and finished the manuscript was finished in 1998 uh that was called pilgrim foxes with uh with jim norton and a guy called ken jones now deceased um who was a very big figure in the high one developing high one and the three of us were interested in the high one form in particular when no one was writing it and in fact i'm not 100 percent sure but i think pilgrim foxes which is is we each have a section in it it was a presentation of high one writing I think at the time it was the only book in English focused on Highbun. I'm pretty sure of that. I'm 100% sure. And then a guy called David Cobb, who was president of the British Haiku Society at the time, he brought out a long Highbun called, uh, I, think, I think it's called the Spring uh, the Spring Journey to the Saxon Shore. I have it here somewhere. Uh, and that was the kind of first long Highbun published in English that we're aware of. And it's not that long ago. It's only 25 years but at that time, we were doing something that nobody was really doing, very few people were doing. And we were largely ignored, and <laughs> getting nowhere, but we had confidence in the form. So we just patiently pursued it and it just developed over very slowly, over a long period of consistent attention and work and trying to develop the techniques and the craft and the subject matter we could deal with. One thing led to another slowly, and you just eventually people come to you and ask you, you'd be very good to judge this because you seem to know about it. Or, you know, then you uh, by the way, my first solo collection, Let's uh, let Silence Speak, was it took, I, I did it 20 years. I, I covered 20 years of work. And I'm forever saying to writers, don't rush the publication, whatever you do. Because once it's, it's we publish on paper, like we print things on paper, but they they are actually published in stone. You cannot change it later. It's for life, you know. So I'm I was always slow to move, slow to submit, slow to publish. Uh, uh, so I built it up over very slowly over a very long period of time, and I'm very fond. I there's a, a saying in the arts attributed to Albert Finney. But I'm not sure if he actually said this, but I hear people say that he said it all the time. I can't find it um, anywhere where I can be sure of that. But the gist of it is very good. He said, uh, a body of work done to a high standard over a long period of time does not go unnoticed. And I've always taken that as my kind of uh, mantra, but that I've always held on to that idea that you work slowly to the highest standard you can over a very long period of time, not just long, but as long as it takes. And then the the world will be kind to it. <laughs> the world will respond to it. But the, the work is the critical thing. The length of time you're prepared to, to be patient and uh, to work 
uh, as carefully as you can and craft things to the end of their your best of your ability and move on and keep moving on. That I, I that I think that's the answer to what you're asking me. It it took a long time and and very slowly. I I think it's always been an element there because when we were running, when myself and Jim were running, uh. Haiku Spirit, he always found my work very dark and he he set up a little section in the publication called At the Edge, Haiku at the Edge, meaning they were a bit edgy or dealt with subjects that wouldn't typically be associated with the form. And my work was always in there and he almost set it up to be able to put my work somewhere that didn't jar with everybody else, which was so always very kind of rosy and so on. Having said that, I think it's important to know that I don't, I recognize the darkness people talk about when they talk about this, it was very dark, uh, but I don't recognize darkness as dark <laughs> because for me, it things are neither good or bad and things are not dark or bright. And it's in the darkness that you find the light. That's where the light is clear to you. So I don't deliberately set out to be dark. I don't think I'm writing anything dark when I'm writing. I just write whatever whatever's occurring to me to write. And then, uh, but I'm not, I'm not reluctant to, there's no stone I won't over, you know, lift. There's nowhere I won't look and there's nowhere I won't go. And therefore that's because of that, I tend to go into whatever's, whatever's in the ether for me. So whether it's war, death, mayhem, anything that's going, I, I don't shy away. And I think that's partially because I, I did train in psychiatry and came across the very dark side of life because in psychiatry you do come across some term psychiatry is a very positive arena to be in but you come across a lot of darkness too and it, i never i felt very comfortable i feel comfortable as comfortable in darkness as i do in non-darkness be like <laughs> non-darkness we could say that so i don't think it's it's not deliberate i don't set out to do it it just it appears and sometimes people focus on that but my main message of the God of Bones, for example, is that everything is okay, that the world is okay. And I think that's a message people are not necessarily willing to embrace because they can't help but think it's not okay, it's not okay, it's not okay. And in that sense, Albert Camus would have been a big influence philosophically on me. Did this man who did say, in the end, everything is okay. Everything is not necessarily as it should be because it's not, but that life is beautiful even in the midst of the worst darkness it remains beautiful and that's something i think has come to me from zen and i'll mention this about zen people have this idea that zen is a very tranquil and beautiful experience well i've never experienced it like that <laughs> and i don't know anyone who's really practiced it that would come away and say that was a lovely uh, sitting there we had <laughs> that doesn't happen it's usually physically very painful and mentally very difficult. It's extremely difficult to the point where most people don't tolerate it for too long. Uh, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. And I would make that comparison that there is the beauty in Zen and you do get a sort of tranquility, if you like to put it like that, but it comes at a very high price and you pay a lot in both physical and mental uh, difficulty. And I will go as far as say pain. Pain is that the experience of Zen is one of direct confrontation with physical and mental and emotional pain. And it's always like that. And I've never seen it any other way. But from that, we get a great deal of, I'd say, benefit or we we, we develop a, a different sense of the world that's actually incredibly positive. And that's, I see that in the writing too. So I don't think of it as necessarily dark. My father died just over a year ago, and I spent a year visiting the grave uh, reg every week. And um, his grave is in a very remote rural place. Uh, so it's it's a strange old graveyard. It's essentially a field among fields, and it's very almost inaccessible. That's where he chose to be buried, very close to where he was born. You can see the house he was, the roof of the house he was born in from there. So I end up spending a lot of time in a graveyard 
uh, every week for a year and writing whatever came from there. And, and so it's a, it's really an exploration of grief. And that manuscript is finished and it's a working title, A Patch of Earth. And for a few years, I've been writing about my experiences of growing up in poverty in where I described earlier uh, in the north north side of Dublin, um, where life was extremely difficult and quite violent. Uh, and I'm writing about my experiences of living in, you know, the, I moved into a, an area of these very deprived uh, big blocks of flats, as it were, you know, in a big housing estate that was at the time at 70% unemployment and huge amounts of drug abuse and all kinds of crime and the whole works. And uh, I'm trying to articulate what life, you know, just life, what that life was like. And uh, so I've written quite a bit. Some of it is already published and I'm working on that. And that's the working title of that is Waiting Day, which is a very particular phrase that people used in, in that milieu when you run out of money the day before you get your cash in the dole. It's called a waiting day and you relied on neighbours to feed you. And uh, so I'm, I'm going back into that world. I've been going back into that world and try to articulate that not in, again, neither positively or negatively. And I don't, it's not journalistic either. It's just what that is like and what it is like, not for me uh, in particular. I, I'm conscious that to write well, you have to appeal, you have to take in a multitude of experiences around you, not just your own. So in that sense, I don't regard it as, people often say this is kind of memoir, but I, I, it's not really memoir as I think of memoir, in the sense that it's not about my memories. I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I try to put myself into all the characters. I create composite characters of all the people I knew and lived with around me. And and I try to give get, give them a, that that whole world expression rather than my personal experiences. I don't think my personal experiences are particularly relevant. In a strange way. <laughs> <laughs>